to week at a college, I shall leave nameless, and the focus was reconciliation, and that college had a new professor on staff from Nebraska. Now, you know there are not too many brothers in Nebraska. <laughs> About the middle of the week, uh, he thought that I was preaching pretty accurately, and he invited uh, his wife and two daughters to come and listen, and when I finished the sermon, he wanted me to meet them, and I met the wife, and I met the oldest daughter, six, and the youngest daughter, Ruthie, was standing behind her dad's leg with a little stick with a star on it. You know, three-year-olds, uh, she wouldn't come for anything, and so after a while, we stopped trying, and we started talking about the wonders of reconciliation, and halfway through the conversation, little Ruthie came from behind her dad's leg, waved the one in front of me, and said, now you are white. <laughs> her mother and dad turned immediately red. And I had to restrain myself from saying, it didn't work, did it? <laughs> uh, you see, things like that can happen in a way that can sort of knock us off our balance. And that may not be the way to do reconciliation, but the way we respond to those kind of inadvertent things will determine whether or not we are reconcilers. She was trying to help me out, and the question is... <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> the question is, how are you going to react when you face situations? I don't know about you, but I think that the OJ verdict has done something for us. I think there's almost a debt of gratitude that we have. Because I think what happened with the OJ verdict is it took the mask off. It took the cover off, you know. It let us know and reaffirmed to us that Race is the factor, folks. It is the factor. The O.J. Simpson did not create, the O.J. Simpson verdict did not create racial tension. The O.J. Simpson verdict exposed racial tension. Most of us have wanted to believe that things are getting better. We've been convinced that we're moving along, we're making progress. And we've moved beyond race. It's just, it's a class thing. It's a class issue. We see that it's a race issue. You know, this isn't the first time television taught the majority something in this country. Back when Bull O'Connor unleashed his dogs and the fire hoses, the television cameras were there to capture it. And they showed to the world something we could no longer de deny, that the evil and the bigotry that existed down there, we couldn't live with any longer. So what did we do? We fixed it. Huh. We passed the law. We fixed it. Huh. The disenfranchised became enfranchised, and we fixed it. Now, all these years later, we're glued to our television set. Together, the whole country transfixed, and there we see in split screen, on one side of the screen, the young, white, professional young ladies gasping, crying, angry. And we see the young, professional, black, College students, I think they were Harvard Law School students, rejoicing, celebrating. We're a country huh. alienated. The dramatic moment burst the bubble that we can all get along. There's something wrong. We've not come as far as we thought. We haven't reached Dr. Martin Luther King's new community. We found out that night we're not even in the neighborhood. We're not even in the state. We may not even be on the same planet, people. We didn't get to the new community. The Emancipation Proclamation didn't get us to the new community. Brown versus the Board of Education didn't get us to the new community. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 didn't get us to the new community. Martin and Jack and Bobby and Malcolm didn't bring us there. And Ronald, Newt, Clarence and Rush aren't bringing us there either. And whether you believe it's a contract on America or a contract with America, it ain't going to get us there either. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to give reconciliation a chance. Maybe it's time to give the gospel a chance. The reason that reconciliation is the answer and the reason that it's not too late is that the power of reconciliation is this. In one sentence, this is how I can describe the power of reconciliation. It is the power to turn hatred into love. The power to turn hatred into love. And friends and brothers and sisters, if not now, 
when? If not here, where? If not us, CCDA, who? But to kind of preach on reconciliation here is like preaching to the choir, right? It's kind of like preaching to the choir. And so you might ask, why, why do you preach to the choir? Well, you know what? I found out something. Just because you're in the choir don't mean you're saved. Just because you're in the choir doesn't mean you may ever made it to the mourner's bench. That's for you, Shirley. That old preacher used to say, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Mm. I discovered something. Everybody talking about reconciliation ain't doing it. Mm. Humbly speaking, two great books were published in 1993 on this topic. Mm. When, the publishers, when the publishers published these books, they, wonder if, they wondered if they would sell three, 5,000 copies. Mm -hmm. Because they wondered if out there in the Christian world anybody was paying attention to the reconciliation subject. Mm. Not three years ago. I was talking to a secretary of the church that I'm going to be speaking at on Sunday. And I asked her, what's the topic of the Sunday? And she said, well, it's that, that buzzword, you know, racial reconciliation. That's not three years. Three years, I can re three years ago, I can remember denominational executives not knowing how to pronounce racial reconciliation. And now it's a buzzword three years later. And you know what? I'm excited about the opportunity. But here in the family, if I can say this, it scares me a little bit too. It scares me. It scares me a lot. I'm a little afraid that we're changing the old stuff into the new verbiage. I'm kind of afraid now that we've got good biblical exegesis together, we're twisting the same old things and putting it in a new package. And then we ain't really doing it. You know, we have a propensity to change the message in order to fulfill our self-interest. Well. I heard about this uh, fellow down in, Mexi in, in Texas who robbed a bank. He was making his getaway, and the sheriff caught him a couple of towns away. He wanted to get the money back, so he asked him where the money was. Well, the fellow happened to be Mexican, couldn't speak Spanish. The guy was Anglo sheriff, so he said to him, he, he found a translator to talk to him. Got a guy in, and he asked him to translate. He says, okay, ask him where the money is. The fellow came back through the translator, and the translator says, he say, he don't have the money. So the sheriff lost his patience, pulled his gun out, put it to the fellow's head, and said to him, you tell him, tell me where the money is, I'm going to blow his brains out. That did not need a translation. The guy started to babble. He said, tell him, tell him, in, in, in Spanish to the translator. He says, tell him it's two towns back in the old well. Pull out the stone right above the crank. Tell him it's all there. Tell him it's all there. Translator came back to the sheriff and he said, he say, in many words, he no afraid to die. <laughs> you know what? We like to change the message sometimes to fit our personal needs, to fit our own agenda. We wrap it in a package that benefits us. It's not too late. It's not too late to turn hatred into love, folks. But you know what? Reconciliation will never be pro popular. Biblical racial reconciliation will never be popular. Why? I've got to show you this, this beautiful magazine. I mean, you can just look at the cover of this magazine and tell how beautiful this magazine is. This is a product of CCDA. I look at this cover and I say, the people that produce this magazine are something special. We got some resources in CCDA. Spencer and Chris Rice, Spencer Perkins and Chris Rice are a dynamic duo. And I'm going to say, Spencer, wherever you are, I'm going to say public what I said to you, private. It's time to grab that skinny, honky friend of yours, pull him out, both of you, out into the limelight, get out from underneath your daddy's shadow a little bit. You men are men of the pen. You guys have put for us a product that says the pen is mightier than the sword. Mm. You brothers, we have a, a debt of gratitude and everybody here needs to get and, be, and get this every time it comes out. But the reason I like this magazine is it says this is a resource for people serious about racial healing. They're serious about racial healing. That's what we need to be, folks. We need to be serious about racial healing. What does it mean to be serious about racial healing? You see, that's why I don't think it'll ever be popular. 
John Perkins said to us in the first Bible study, if you want to be into racial reconciliation, you're going to suffer. That's why racial reconciliation is never going to be popular, because racial reconciliation means we're going to suffer, folks. Many of us want the healing, but we don't want the knife. Few of us are truly serious about racial reconciliation because we're not serious about racial healing. Because racial healing only happens through wounded healers. People, we're wounded healers. We're wounded, damaged goods, all of us. We were born in sin, exposed to sin, and participated in sin. And we're all damaged goods. We're wounded. When you understand our woundedness, that's when we can be used. But you know, the imagery that comes to my mind on this reconciliation thing is back in the Civil War. The first battle of the Civil War, I think it was Bull Run. What happened is that everybody from Washington came out to watch, to have fun, to watch what was going to happen in this skirmish as the North beat the South. And you know what happened? Those people sitting there were overrun because the battle was taken by the South and the bloody wounded soldiers literally came and overrun those people who were there at the battlefield to have fun. Racial reconciliation is not about having fun. Racial reconciliation is a spiritual war and there's pain and there's struggle. And coming from this soldier, this vet, if you don't experience this, if you haven't experienced this yet, my challenge to you is you haven't been on the battlefield yet. We are... A little more than a year ago, I sat in a board meeting with Promise Keepers and Coach Bill McCartney came in. He had a break from the football season, and they said, Coach, give us a word on reconciliation. And he said, I can only say one thing. Mm -hmm. It's a war. And I believe that's true. And in many ways, my brothers and sisters of CCDA, you are right now in a war room. Mm -hmm. And in order to get to where God wants us to be, and that's truly being reconciled, you and I will have to cross a minefield. Yeah. And that minefield is racial division and racial difference and racism. And if you cross a minefield and you don't have a mine detector, don't know where you're going, you're going to step on a landmine and I'll have to tell you what the result is. Well, the, land, the, the mine detector that God has given us is the Word of God. That's right. Uh, we need to deal with the Word of God. We got a lot of opinions about the march. We got a lot of opinions about the verdict. We got a lot of opinions, and those opinions differ within races. Well, it doesn't matter if we have different opinions. Are you backing up your stand with the Word of God? That's the question at this. I want to unfold your basic theology of reconciliation. It is what I consider the nerve center, and we've got to stand on that foundation. It's, lo it's located in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The whole chapter is good. I want to take you from verse 14 to verse 21 because I think there's a radical dynamic, and if you and I are going to be involved in this, we need to deal with it. I believe God is bringing revival. I believe revival is going to happen, but I believe the manifestation of revival will be known when we see reconciliation a reality, and we have to take the lead in that. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, I think there are uh, five radicals that stand in front of us. Radical 1, we need a radical love. Verse 14 says, the love of Christ controls us. What is that love? Jesus Christ went to the cross and he died for your sin and mine. A holy God manifested himself in human flesh, went to the cross and died for your sin and mine. That's a radical love because he died for us, yea, while we were yet sinners. That love is a love that must control you and I. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is the grace of God. He sent Jesus to die, yea, while we were yet sinners. I don't know how you look at that. I call it radical. So we need a love that's radical. The second thing we need is a radical outlook on life. Verse 16 says this. It says, we no longer look at things from a worldly point of view. In other words, we don't look at things like the world. We, we, we are radical in how we look at things. 
What do we mean by radical? Well, let's go back and visit what Martin said. His dream is that one day uh, men would be judged not by the color of their skin, but rather by the content of their character. Now, that's a radical outlook in which we're going to look at people and we're going to judge them by their content, who they are, rather than by what's outside. There's another radical that must grab us, and that is verse 17 says that anybody is in Christ, man, woman, is a new creature. Old things passed away, new things come. That's the experiencing of a radical moment. A moment when you move out of darkness into light. A moment when you realize that you, you, you were a sinner, but you could be a new kind of sinner. A sinner saved by grace uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And when that happened and you confessed your sins and made a turn, then you experience in that a radical moment in which you change. Then... Once you have embraced a radical love, once you have a radical outlook on life, once you have experienced a radical moment, then God has given you a radical ministry. Verse, uh, verse 18 says uh, that he has commended unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, and namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and he's committed to us the word of Christ. Now, what is this ministry of reconciliation? It is, it has a subjective and an objective thrust. The subjective thrust is that it's a done deal. Jesus paid it all at Calvary. It's an objective thrust because uh, it has to continue to happen through me. Uh, when I experience a radical moment, when I give my life to Jesus, then my life must radiate reconciliation and everything I say and do must reflect that. How must I do that? By understanding the two greatest commandments. I got to love God with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my strength. Then I got to learn how to love my neighbor as myself. Now, when my life represents that what I do is love God and what I do is love my neighbor and everything I'm about reflects that, then I am in the business of being a, a, a radical person who is radically changed and I have this radical ministry that says, I got to love that Hispanic man who brings the meal. Why? If I love God, he's my neighbor. I got to love him. I got to love that black man that drives the school bus. Why? If I love God, he's my neighbor, and I got to love him. Uh, I got to love that Asian family that moved down the block. I got to go bake some banana bread and take it to them. I got to love them. Why? Because uh, they're my neighbor, and I got to love them. I got to love the Native American who is the forgotten person. Why? Because they're my neighbor, and I got to love them. And brothers and sisters of the darker hue, I got to love that white boss man that won't promote me, won't give me my just due, hold me off everything, but I got to love him. Why? If I love God, he too is my neighbor. And if I'm living out the truth of reconciliation, then I got to love my neighbors myself. Then if I embrace a radical love, if I've experienced a radical moment, if I have a radical outlook on life, if I have received this radical ministry of reconciliation, not just given to Billy Graham and Luis Palau, but to everybody who experienced verse 17, the new creation, then I'm ready for verse 20. I'm ready to be a radical wall buster for Jesus. Now, now some of you have Bibles with the mild version. It says in your verse 20, ambassadors for Christ. Now that's a mild version, but, but, but what do I mean by that? Well, ambassadors for Christ. Who is Christ? And beginning with the word, the word with God, and the word was God. Well, Christ is God. Then it says that God is, and called in the first John 4, God is love. And then it says Jesus Christ is the way and the truth. Uh, and then if I add them all up, then I get the gospel. And so if, if, if indeed uh, I'm an ambassador for Christ, then I'm an ambassador for God. If I'm an ambassador for Christ, I'm an ambassador for love. If I'm an ambassador for Christ, I'm an ambassador for the truth. If I'm an ambassador for Christ, I'm an ambassador for the gospel. And from all of that, then I'm ready to bust down walls for Jesus. Amen. And that makes me a radical person for God Almighty. God has called us, and this is the theology of Brothers and sisters, let's stop doing it because it feels good. Let's do it because it's in God's Word and it's a mandate. Let's be radical wall busters for Jesus. We'd like to finish our time by sharing a few principles. Now, we don't have time to really lay the principles out. We'd be honored if you would uh, purchase our book and... 
get those principles, but they would give you a fuller, they'd give you a fuller story. Because you have to have the whole context, we're kind of pulling a few things out of context. Intentionality. Intentionality is the purposeful, positive, planned activity that facilitates reconciliation. Intentionality, that's, that's what you need if you want to be an ambassador of reconciliation. You see, intentionality says, we didn't get into this mess by accident, we're not going to get, it out, get out of it by accident. It means you've got to take some actions. These walls were built on purpose. They've got to be dismantled on purpose with intentionality. You see, it's popular for whites, and especially I think a lot of us here, to see ourselves as enlightened. We're reconciled. Well. We're above all of this mess. It's popular for this group to describe themselves as colorblind. Mm. We don't see color. Mm. We think of that as a positive statement of racial reconciliation. In reality, it's denial, people. In reality, it's a statement of ignorance, people. It's okay to be ignorant, but it's not okay to stay ignorant. We're all born ignorant. Do me a favor, if you ever use this phrase, don't use it anymore. And I'm going to tell you why. Red, brown, yellow, red, they don't want to be. They don't want you to be colorblind. They don't want you to deny their color. If you don't believe me, people, ask someone who's red, brown, yellow, black. You see... When we describe it like that, you know what we're saying? We're saying we're above all that. It's justificational rhetoric. You see, it says we didn't get affected by all of this mess. We're colorblind. We don't see it all. We're just fine. We don't have to do anything intentional. That's what we're saying. John Perkins, I heard say that he is messed up. Well, I got to tell you, if John Perkins got messed up, hmm. I got messed up. Hmm. We can't be colorblind. We're not colorblind. That's justificational rhetoric. Okay, now, I got a lot of black brothers and sisters saying amen. <laughs> amen to this justificational rhetoric. Mm. Mm. Set you. Mm. You know what? There's, I, I discovered something. There's justificational rhetoric in the black community, too. And now I'm going to really mess. What you say? I'm going to be messing with some folks now. This is what I think is justificational rhetoric. It is this, African-Americans, this is a definition of racism. African-Americans cannot be racist. You see, racism is prejudice plus power. Black people in this country don't have the power. They can't be racist. I didn't hear any amens, really. <laughs> justification. <laughs> you see, I think that's justification. I think that's justification for staying where we're at. Now, I think you need to hear this from me, brothers and sisters. I couldn't have said this to you but a few years ago. I couldn't have made this challenge to you, African-American brothers. But you know what? Over 20 years ago, I did something intentional. I moved into the hood. Uh -huh. I've been there for 23 years. I've lived there. I've worked there. I've ministered there for all those years. I've raised my children there. And my son taught me something about this definition of racism. You see, it's a definition of racism that doesn't make it on the streets. It doesn't cut it on the streets. You see, colorblind, don't come into my neighborhood talking about being colorblind. But you know, I learned something. This definition of racism don't make it on the streets either. Now, it may fly in the university and in the seminary and the ivory towers of intellectual debate, but this don't make it where I live. And let me tell you why. When my son was a freshman in high school, Going across the city <clears throat> to go to Lane Tech High School, he got on the local bus, driving through some of the hardest areas of our neighborhood. It wasn't anything unusual for him. He'd been a minority all of his life. He didn't see anything different. He was riding on that bus with his friend from the neighborhood, and they were going along, and a gangbanger got on that bus, and he walked down that aisle. And he, with all his force, slugged the only... <laughs> Blue-eyed. He punched out the only blue-eyed, blonde-haired boy for miles around. And when Nathan came home, he was angry.
He was humiliated in front of his friend, and he went right to the juggler. He said to me, Dad, I hate black people. Black people are racist. Now, what was I supposed to say to him? Nathan, I read in Sojourner's Magazine. <laughs> racism is prejudice plus power. You see, that's what racism is, and those kids don't have the ultimate power in society, and therefore that wasn't an act of racism. Are you crazy? It's justificational rhetoric that denies responsibility. But you know what? Intentionality says when this kind of stuff happens, you don't cut and run. You go against the grain. Intentionality says you work with your young man. It's not time to leave. And that's what I try to do. I try to say, you know, Nathan, we're all damaged goods. We're all damaged goods. Damaged white folks, damaged black folks. We're all damaged goods. I helped a little bit with my son. But you know what? He needed to go talk to some of his friends. He needed to get this out. He needed to tell people what he felt like. And you know what my son did? <laughs> He went and shared this with his good friends, and they're all black, every one of them. Intentionality says if you make some moves, reconciliation might not be fun, but it's fulfilling. People, we can't justify anything. We can't justify wh where we're at in the name of racial reconciliation. But if you're going to be intentional, you say, you might be saying, I'll make it plain what it is what is it that I need to be intentional about and I'm gonna I'm gonna say just one thing and it's our next principle it's the principle of a committed relationship if you're gonna be intentional about racial reconciliation what you need to do is establish a committed relationship racial reconciliation becomes a reality in that committed relationship when two people join their lives together in a committed relationship that says divorce is not an option we're gonna battle this thing out in the trenches we're gonna fight hand-to-hand -hand friendship that's what we're gonna do committed relationship says that I won't cut and run when the time gets tough committed relationship says I love you I'm gonna learn about you we're gonna do this thing together and then we're going to learn about things that we don't understand. After we did our workshop this, this morning, a man came up to me and he said an tr incredible statement. He said, because we talked a little bit about the O.J. verdict, and he said, O.J., I, I, this is a black man, he says, I, I think O.J. was guilty, I think he did it. But when that not guilty verdict was announced, my heart jumped. I can't explain it, but somehow I felt vindicated. All of that past pain and injustice, it was just somehow carried away. If you don't have a committed relationship, you won't ever understand that. You won't ever understand. I don't know how much I can understand it, but he can help me. He can empower me. This is my best friend. I'm committed to him. I don't agree with him 55, 60% of the time. 70. 80 when we start but I when we right. start but the committed relationship says we're gonna carry it to the end we're gonna work it out I've had many white folks say to me the OJ verdict damaged my relationship with my black friend I don't know if it'll ever be the same it didn't damage anything it didn't damage it it revealed it to you it showed it to you it's too shallow it's too short on commitment it's too surface if your relationship can't stand a little bit of pain, it ain't worth anything. It's an opportunity. Your relationship can go down deeper now. You got something to talk about now. You got something to deal with now. And if your relationship is committed, you'll do it. Don't cut and run. Relationship ain't fun. It ain't fun. God sent his son into the world not to have fun, to have fulfillment to establish a committed relationship with us so we can be reconciled to God. But the way that leads to death is broad. It's broad, folks. The way that leads to reconciliation is the cross. There's few that find it, people. There's few that find it. A lot of people talking about reconciliation. Ain't a not lot of us doing it. Reconciliation is a journey, and it's hard work. 
We say in our principles that our principles of reconciliation along racial lines, across racial lines, are analogous to marriage. The same stuff it requires for marriage to make it is exactly what's required if we're going to have committed relationships. My new definition for marriage, want to hear it? It is a continuum of going from one conflict to another. Thank you, married folks. How do you have joy in marriage? It depends completely on whether or not you resolve the conflict. Sweep it under the rug and you got some unhappy campers, but resolve the conflict and the night time is the right time. Make it plain. Yeah. <laughs> you know what We need, the next principle is the principle of sincerity. The next principle is the principle of sincerity. Let me say this. All black folks trust all white folks implicitly, amen? I, I, got, I mixed it up. All white folks trust all black folks, folks implicitly, amen? No, we don't trust one another because we aren't sincere and we aren't transparent. Here's the principle of sincerity, the definition. The willingness to be transparent, including the self-disclosure of what I feel, what I think, what my attitude, what my perception is with the goal of resolution and building a foundation of trust. Willing to be transparent, self-disclosed. Now listen to these things. Which one needs to be factual? What I think, no. What I feel, no. My attitude, no. My perception, no. None of those have to be fact, but they drive my train. And I have to, I have to self-disclose them. Now, most time when we tell somebody that, we want to get it off of our chest. No. We got to do it in order to bring about resolve. We had a good interaction in our workshop, and, and we didn't differ. Black folks did not agree, rather. We, we differed. We did not agree. But the goal was, can we find common ground? Uh, can I love you as myself, even though I don't agree with you? Uh, so sincerity says, we've got to be transparent. And then the principle of empowerment. I want to close out time with that. Empowerment is the use of repentance and forgiveness to create an environment for reconciliation. In any marriage, you have a whole lot of repenting and a whole lot of forgiveness if you've got a wonderful environment. So that needs to happen in any relationship, in a committed relationship. A lot of repenting and a lot of forgiving. Jesus Christ went to the cross to die for your sins and mine. And when they spit in his face and hit him with his fist and put spikes in his hands and his feet and crown a thorn on his head, nailed him to an old rugged cross, and he looked at those vile people, the son of the living God, the Messiah, the innocent one, the Lamb of God, the first word from the cross was, Father, forgive them. They don't have a clue. And unless there's a lot of willingness to repent and forgive, White folks, you've got to take some responsibility. Hmm. You've got to take some ownership. Quit saying, don't blame me for what my ancestors or what somebody else did. Yeah, if you're white, take responsibility. <laughs> and black folks, we've got to forgive. Yeah. And you know what forgiveness means? Never bring it up again. And black folks, we've got to take some responsibility. White folks are scared of us because we are violent people. We don't like to admit that. I don't know about the rest of you black folks, but I grew up hearing on a regular basis this phrase, don't mess with me, I'll cut your throat. <laughs> yeah, some of you heard it too. We are violent people. Guess what we have to take responsibility for, my brothers and sisters? Creating that vein of fear. Let me close with this. My wife, Paulette, I share this with her permission, is one-fourth white. And the reason she's one-fourth white because her grandmother worked into a North Carolina plantation field for a white owner who called her grandmother in and required her grandmother to lay with him. The end result of that forced act of intimacy is that her grandmother conceived and gave birth to her father. Her father was embarrassed, her grandmother was embarrassed, she was embarrassed. Paulette said, 
Man, the way I got here is not right, but I'm sure glad I'm here. <laughs> uh, I, I just kind of like to know something about my, my grandfather. I, I'd like to know. So she'd ask her dad and ask her dad. He'd never tell her anything. So finally, after badgering her dad for a while, about nine years ago, a year before her dad passed away, he finally told us that his name is Ewing. Next summer, we went to North Carolina, went to the Bureau of Vile Stats, and we looked at the records all the way back to 1913. That's where they began. That's where our search ended. But our dad was born in 1912. Paulette's face dropped, and the tears welled up in her eyes. And I said, honey, don't cry. That, that's God's grace. Uh, if we'd have found those white folks, they would have disowned you, called you a trouble man. That's God's grace. God's looking after you. She said, you may see that, but I feel an emptiness. I feel a void. I'd like to know who I'm. I'd like to know my grandfather. Paulette's grandmother had one sister worked in the same field for the same man, called her in, required to do the same thing with the same result. She conceived and gave birth. Paulette's grandmother only had one son born this way, and Paulette's grandmother only had one son, her father. That's the legacy of my wife's family. Well, what does my wife think about white folks? Mm. Well, some of her, in a circle of her closest friends, three of her very closest friends are of the light of hue. Lonnie K. Ryan, who's sitting here next to her now. Vicki Waterlack. Why? Because my wife has learned how to forget what lies behind mm -hmm. uh, and reach for what lies ahead. She's a wall buster for Jesus. Uh, she doesn't judge by the color of the skin, but by the content of the character. And so she can embrace, and, and she's not being tied down by that. I shared this at a men's conference, and I was done. I was walking out off the stage and walking toward the water fountain. And as I walked toward the water fountain, a white brother with long blonde hair, he saw me. I, he called out my name, and his hand was waving. And, and, and I looked, and he, he was trying to speak and, and moving his mouth, and nothing was coming out. And, and as he got closer to me, uh, I could see tears was coming down his face. And he was trying to speak, but he couldn't. And so he just started pointing at his name tag and pointing, pointing at his name tag. And when I got close, I saw why his name tag said Jim. Ewing. And he walked up to me with his hands trembling and he, and he held me and he said, Raleigh, he said, I feel so bad about what happened to your wife and your family. He said, look at me. My face is white. My name is Ewing. Can I take responsibility for all Ewings and all whites and ask you and beg your wife and your family, please, please forgive us for what took place. I said, Jim, in the name of Jesus, I forgive you. And I embraced him, and we wept on one another's shoulder. I couldn't wait to tell Paul that. I went and called up. She was at my son's uh, our house, and, and I told her the story. And the minute I said Ewing, she gasped, and she started sobbing and sobbing. I said, oh, I finished. I said, Paul, I tell me, tell me, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? And she says, I feel reconciled. She said, the moment you said Ewing, I knew what you were going to say. And at that moment, the Almighty God took a burden off my shoulder. At that moment, he filled the chasm. At that moment, he erased it. And I don't need to know. I feel reconciled. I wonder if you think this is an emotional thing and, hey, it's not real and don't have me that generational sin. What have you? Let me tell you what happened. That was four years ago. Four months ago, my wife was in the basement with one of my sons and, and she found some papers and she was going through it and she found a death certificate for her, her grandmother and a death certificate for her father. My son, Reginald, compared the dates and you know what they discovered? That her grandmother was 10 years old when she conceived. 10 years old. When I came home, she was sitting at a little small table, and I sit there, and she was sitting on the other side of it, and she told me that, and she handed me those papers and told me, and man, my, my stomach got tight, and I, I couldn't look up at her. She was right over there, and I just, with my head down, I said, Paula, Paula, how does that make you feel? She reached over and grabbed my face and smashed it around, and I looked up, and I saw the biggest smile and the brightest eyes, and she said, I still feel reconciled. <laughs> Jim Ewing was a brother who took responsibility. You know what he is? A wall buster for Jesus because he took responsibility. Brothers and sisters, we want to leave you with this challenge. <laughs> the mask is off. We are polarized. And God wants us to be one. Are you willing to make a commitment 
to not say some of my best friends are white or black or, or Hispanic. Are you willing, one, each one, reach one, and have a committed relationship in which you say divorce is not an option? Are you, are you willing to be intentional and every time something comes up, like a conflict, Matthew 18, resolve it to the praise and glory of God. Are you willing to be transparent and stop playing games and express what you really feel, not to hurt somebody, but to bring resolve? Amen. And brothers and sisters, are you willing to let repentance and forgiveness and brokenness be a daily call on your life? CCDA, if you can do that, then we'll be marching on the Zion, not only behind Jesus, but behind John Perkins, and CCDA can lead the charge of being wall busters and make reconciliation a reality in America. Let's be wall busters for Jesus. Amen. Noches a todos. All right, learning some Spanish. Que pasa? To hear Gordy speak Spanish is is really something, you know. It's a great treat. Esta noche les quiero invitar a todos ustedes, amigos de la villita, que vengan a mi cuarto después de esta reunión. Si tienen dinero. Pero no si tienen un poquito de dinero, si tienen mucho dinero. Vengan a mi cuarto todos los amigos de la vida. Man, I'm learning from John Perkins, I tell you. And if you don't understand what I said, well, you know, learn some Spanish. One of the most familiar passages that uh, we have heard and we are, have been instructed by and taught in CCDA is the passage in John chapter 4 about the Samaritan woman. This person that, that had no possibility of having an experience with God, who was locked out of relationship with God, who was on the outside, who was judged and, and who herself became a victim of a lifestyle that kept her from really having fellowship with God. And Jesus, on his, on his travels, instead of going around Samaria, he said, you know what, we're going to go through Samaria because there's something there that I got to do. And he brought his disciples and he brought them along with him and they stopped and he's uh, there at this well and he says, you know what, i got to rest here for a while. And they go off and uh, they go to find food. And while they're gone trying to feed their stomachs, and while they're gone trying to satisfy their needs, Jesus has one of the most incredible encounters with anyone that's recorded in history. And he meets this woman and he begins to minister and love her and, and reveal to her that he is the Messiah, the one true uh, Savior that was sent by God to bring life to the world. And he reveals to her that, that, that she herself can have that life, even though she was a sinner, even though her lifestyle and, and others, she was a sinner, but she was also a person who had been sinned against. And Jesus Christ touches her life, and an incredible thing happens, and, and, and ministry takes place not unlike the kind of ministry that you and I want to see happen in our communities. Jesus the Reconciler. And then when the disciples come back, they come in and, and it says in the meantime they come and they, and they find Jesus and they're oblivious to what just happened. And he says, they say to him, Teacher, teacher, have something to eat. But he answered to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Les dice, yo tengo algo que comer que ustedes no conocen. You don't know nothing about this food. 
And so the disciples started asking among themselves, well, you know, who, who brought him the Taco Bell? You know, who brought him the food? Where'd he get food? Why isn't he hungry? And then Jesus makes one of the most incredible statements in the Bible and one that has fed my soul. He says, my food, he said, is to obey the will of the one who sent me and to finish what he gave me to do, to finish the work that he gave me to do. Mi comida es hacer la voluntad del que me envió y terminar su trabajo. Well, I want to tell you that tonight, that that is what has filled my heart. That I believe that the reason that we're here and the reason that I'm here today is because one day Jesus came into my life and he began to tear away all other distractions, all other priorities to where I too could say like Jesus, my food is to do the will of he who sent me and to accomplish that work that he sent me to do. Mi comida, what I need to live and to be sustained, the thing that drives me, the thing that gives me purpose, the thing that, that makes me who I am. It ain't food, even though I love food. But it's to do the will of my Father. I, 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 that's, there's nothing I want more. And they didn't understand. The disciples didn't understand what he was talking about. But tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about how our hearts can be gripped with the same response that Jesus himself responded with. That I believe that's what God wants to strip us to in our life. I believe that's what we've been hearing uh, people exhort us to, that in the issues of reconciliation, in the issues of, of doing the will of God and not just talking about it, that we would be able to say, my food, what, what, what makes me full, what makes me who I, I am is the, the fact of doing the will of he who sent me and then finishing the work that he has sent me to do. Well, let me tell you what my food is tonight. I believe that God has laid on my heart a desire, number one, to be a man of God, to be a man of character, to be a man after God's own heart. And you know what that means? You know what God is doing to me? God is breaking me. God is tearing me apart. God is revealing to me how sinful I am. That I can't be who he wants me to be in my own power. That I can't meet people's expectations. That I can't do the things that, that I know need to be done. And so as I strip all of that away, I scream and I yell in my heart the same thing that King David said in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing more I need. What shall I want? There's nothing else. There's nothing else. The Lord is my shepherd. My call. And I believe your call as a Christian. The very first thing we need to, to, to get straight is that God wants to make us pure. Men and women of character that love God more than anything else. And then for me, I thank God that he has revealed to me the purpose the, the, that, that I, I can say, this is the job. This is the task that God has called me to. And that is to, to pastor this little church in southwest Chicago in the barrio of La Villita, to, to work there, to live there, to embrace my brothers and sisters there, to be a shepherd and to love and, and, and to raise up Men and women of God who have that same burden to say, Mi comida es hacer la voluntad de Dios. And, and, and that's what God has laid on my heart to do. And then, and then in His mercy and, and, and by His Spirit, to be able to encourage and to move and to challenge other brothers and sisters to do the same kind of thing, to, to embrace barrios, all over this country, all over Latin America, to take the principles of Christian community development and to begin doing the same thing because I believe that 
In this, we have a strategy. We have a tool. We have a biblical approach to bringing transformation to barrios and to communities all over our country that we, I have not found in anything else. I praise God for what he's done in this movement and the way that he has put that on my heart. And let, let me tell you a little bit about the people that God has called me to reach and the people that, that I believe that all of us need to be aware of and know that, 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 you know, to love God is to love the Latino people. Some of you have seen the movie El Norte. It's a movie about a family and, and a people that come to El Norte, to the north from, from uh, Guatemala, from Latin America. And it, 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 it chronicles their journey into Los Angeles, to the north. And you know what happens in this movie? You would not believe the, 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 atro the atrocities that they have to face as they make their way from a, a, a life of poverty into this country, believing that when they get to the north, that they're going to have prosperity and riches and freedom and hope. But when they get to El Norte, you know what they find? They find a country where they are strangers. Even though the Spanish language is plastered all over their streets and all over their freeways, they are aliens and they are unwanted and they are unwelcome. And as we see in this movie, they struggled and they worked and, and they just could not understand why they could not reach the American dream. And they don't even know what the American dream is because it's out of reach. They get closer and closer only to find out that they're further away. And many of our peoples have come to this country seeking this myth, this, myth, this dream that this is not to be found. And they come and they, they search and they work and, and, and they don't find it because they struggle and, and, and they're uh, strangers in a land that is somewhat familiar. And then there's another movie that some of you have seen. It's called American Me. And it's a story of, of, of these young uh, uh, gangbangers and, and, and gang members and, that are in uh, the barrios of Los Angeles and how their whole life is uh, wrapped up in violence and the, and the fellowship of the club, of these gangs. And they are trapped in this lifestyle. They don't know how to function outside of the criminal, criminal justice system. They don't know how to function outside of the gang. No saben cómo vivir en este mundo. They don't know how to live in this world except for in those conditions. They are isolated. They're isolated. Well, that, it's not just a movie, friends. We have many of our young people who, as they are struggling with understanding what it means to be Chicano, a, a Mexican descent or Latino descent, and then living in an Anglo culture where, that is uh, unfamiliar and, and many times antagonistic, they are caught in the middle and they can't even speak to their own parents. They come home and they speak English and their parents respond to them in Espanol. And there's a clash and there's generational gap that tears these kids apart. And I thank God for, for the, the way that God has moved in the life of Bob uh, Salinas in our church who's beginning to raise up these young men and reaching out to them in the name of Jesus and, and making a difference in the life of Caesar, in the life of Jesse and Ernie and Israel. Now, all these biblical names, I'm trying to get Ernie to change his name. If we do that, boy, we'll have something, right? And I'm excited because we know that even though the picture is bleak that is painted in this movie, that there's a new reality, there's a new hope that is only able to be realized through the gospel. And then there's that movie, Stand and Deliver. One of my heroes is Jaime Escalante, this teacher, this math teacher, this trigonometry teacher in East L.A. again. And he comes, and he comes with a message of hope a message of expectation, and he takes these barrio kids that nobody else gave a rip about, nobody gave a chance, and he says, Sabes que? You can be somebody. You can excel. You can learn math. You can, you can do it. And I love when he tells his students, Johnny, come on, you can do it, Johnny. Don't give up. 
And then one day, he tells the story of a man, of, 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 of uh, uh, one of his classrooms when he has two students, both of them named Johnny. And one day they have an open house, and one of the Johnnies is a brilliant student, all kinds of potential. And then the other student, Johnny, is barely getting by. He never comes to class. He's struggling. He, he doesn't know if he's going to make it. And so the night of open house, Johnny's mother comes, and she comes into the door, the, the classroom door, and she begins talking to the teacher, the Jaime, and then he begins to say, oh, I can't, but one can't tell you how great your son Johnny is. Es un estudiante fabuloso, es increíble. And she, he goes on and tells her how great he is. And, and the mother is about to drop dead. She can't believe it. And she just is wide-eyed and she leaves home all excited. The next day, the Johnny who was always late, never came to class, walks in. He's the first one there. He goes and he sits down at the front of the classroom and he goes up with a kind of terror in his heart and shy and he goes up to Jaime and he says, I want to thank you for all the great things you told my grandmother about me last night. And he said, man, from that day on, Johnny was the best student I had in class because we know that people rise to the level of expectation. And then there's the movie Mi Familia. And in this movie Mi Familia, it's a Mexican family that, 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 that is struggling to, you know, try to figure out who they are again in this country. And one of the scenes that is incredible is when one of the sons who goes to college, he, he, get, he learns how to wear a tie, and, he, and, and, and he's like the Garcia sisters who lost their accent. It's the name of a book. He worked hard to lose his accent. He worked hard to get educated. He worked hard to fit into the culture. And then he comes home, and he brings his, his mujer, his, his vieja, if you're a Mexican, you know. He brings his fiancée to meet his new, her, her new parents-in-law. And she happens to be white. And so he is so nervous because he knows that the rest of his family is going to embarrass him and, and his, his fiancée in front of her parents that came in in their Mercedes and all of this. And he's begging them, please, don't embarrass me. Don't do anything to embarrass me. And it's a, 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 an uncomfortable scene. And they come in, they don't know what to say to each other. They, they haven't taken Raleigh and, Gil, and Glenn's class on reconciliation. They haven't read Chris's and Spencer's books. They haven't made no offering to John. <laughs> and as soon as they come in, one of the, the small Alec older brothers, she says, ¿Sabes qué? Déjame decirte, mi abuelito está enterado allá en el backyard. He says, you know, did, 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 uh, did my brother tell you that our grandfather's buried in the backyard? <laughs> now, that broke the ice. <laughs> you see, for many of us, the only experience we have with Latino brothers and sisters is what we see in the movies. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I thought that I was going to have to grow up like Ricky Ricardo and just play the bongos and sing <laughs> Baba Lou. But I thank God that my food is to do the will of my Father. My food is to accomplish the work that He has called me to do. And God is raising up a new generation of leaders Latino and black and all kinds of other cultures, but I want to talk about the Latino brothers today and sisters because our bodies need men and women of God who come and who bring this passion and this commitment and this desire to work and to give themselves to the most important work there is, serving God and raising up His kingdom. And the only way to bring life is through death. Let me tell you who, I mean, I want, to, I want to tell my wife this today. When I die, this is how I want to be buried. When Cesar Chavez, the leader of the labor movement, right, the UAW, 
When he died, I remember turning on the television set, and I see thousands and thousands of people, and they're carrying this, this martyr, this hero, this, this, this champion for the cause of the farm worker and farm labor, and he is being carried in a casket that's made out of common, plain pine wood. He died living the life. That he died the way he lived, giving of himself to serve his pueblo, to serve his gente. And you know what I want to tell you tonight? That this idea of going into the barrio and doing CCD, of bringing transformation, you know what it's like? It's, it's really like making great salsa. And I want to challenge my brothers and sisters and maybe some of you to commit yourself to make some great salsa in the barrio. To make some great salsa in the barrio. Now, this is what it takes to make great salsa. First, you got to have onions. And you got to get, you know, you chop them all up and you make it all and you, you just get those onions just right. And then you go and you got to have cilantro. You know what cilantro is, right? You get that, and it smells good, and, and after you do the onions, it takes away that onion smell, and you chop up that cilantro, and, and you put that in there right with the onions. And then you get the, the chiles. Now tonight, a bunch of all of the people from La Vita, we went to a Chinese restaurant, and, and one of the guys pulled out this big jalapeno pepper. And I said, man, it's good to be home. <laughs> and so we take those chiles, the jalapenos, and all the other, and we chop them up real spicy because we want to get a good kick when we put it on that food. It don't matter what it is, spaghetti, Chinese food, don't matter. <laughs> so you get those chiles and you put them in there. And then you put in that salt and pepper. And, and, you, and you spice it up. And then the last ingredient that you put in is you get those big, ripe, juicy tomatoes. And you chop them all up and, and you just make, and then you just stir it in and you let it sit for a while. And man, you'd go down and you get those Frito-Lays or the Doritos or whatever and you just go at it. And, and, and you, 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 the, the flavor and the spice and everything is great. Making great salsa in the barrio. And CCDA is a, light, is a lot like that. All kinds of elements, all kinds of ingredients that come together to make great salsa in the barrio. Well, last Christmas, I decided to get a little muppified and a little, uh, you know, happy. And I uh, was going to make, I found a recipe for salsa. And here's what I did. I put all the right ingredients, but then... I got to the point where, where you know, where, where to complete it off, and, and instead of tomatoes, you know what this recipe called for? It called for pineapple and cranberries. So I make it all up, and I put that, and I leave out, and I take this, this holiday salsa to my church, to a potluck, <laughs> and I put it there, and everybody knows that el pastor is el que hizo esta salsa. And, and one by one, they come and they look and they check it out. And they're trying to figure out what it is. And then one of my, you know, homies comes up to me, this old Mexican man in my church, and he me dice, Pastor, ¿sabes qué? No puedes hacer salsa sin los tomates. He says, you can't make authentic salsa without the tomatoes. It took one of my church members to remind me. He said that that's not real salsa. You can't make real salsa without the tomatoes. And I want to tell you tonight that, 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 that for CCDA, that Jesus Christ, that the, the church, that's the tomatoes that allows us to make great salsa in the barrio. That you, it doesn't matter if you do housing. It doesn't matter if you build all kinds of apartments. It doesn't matter if you do youth work and leadership development. If you, if you, if you make salsa without the tomatoes, that ain't real salsa. 
Don't matter if you're bringing education and programs and computers into your church, but if you leave out the tomatoes, it ain't real salsa. It don't matter if you begin to do organizing and you're on the cutting edge and you're bringing all kinds of people and hearing their voice. But if you don't give them Jesus Christ, you're leaving out the tomatoes. Doesn't matter if you're doing economic development and starting pizza parlors in the barrio. Doesn't matter if you're bringing businesses and economic development and doing all kinds of great things. But if you leave out the tomatoes, it's not real salsa. It doesn't matter, folks, what we do. It doesn't matter how creative we are. We, sometimes we get too cute for ourselves. We know what works. We know what's right. We know that Jesus and the church needs to be in the center of everything we do. Now, let me tell you what I believe we need to just think about a little bit. I believe that we need to, as we talk about, recon about relocation, we also need to talk about radical Christian community together, where we're loving one another, where we're living together, where we are becoming an authentic community of brothers and sisters for Christ. It's not enough that we live in the community. It's not enough that we're just there physically, that we're just there on that block. But we need to become one. We need to become familia. And that is a concept that in the barrio is important. It don't matter all the great things you do. It don't matter. You have to be familia. And so as you do church and as you talk about reconciliation, don't forget the tomatoes. Because without the tomatoes, it ain't real salsa. And then as you talk about reconciliation, talk about how to come together. You know, we have this incredible challenge as Latinos because not only do we need to be reconciled to our white brothers and sisters, but we need to be reconciled first generation, recent arrivals, to second and third generation, where we call each other names, we look at each other with mistrust, where we don't, we're not reconciled, we're not one. And God needs to, uh, to, to put that at the forefront of what we do. Because if we don't do that, it's like making salsa without the tomatoes. And we need to be reconciled one Latino culture to another. Because we're not all alike. There are many Latino cultures. There are many countries. And together we are trying to understand what it means to be the reconciled aisle people of God. And redistribution. We have a lot to learn to, in this process of redistribution. Because one of the struggles that we, ha we have as we have people coming and living in our community is, you know what, I want to be real honest with you, that even though we're in the same community, we don't live at the same level. We have discrepancies, and, and people see it, and it hurts our witness. We need to understand what Paul and Jesus said, that when, when uh, one is in need, that the other has to come and provide out of their abundance. What does it mean to be uh, uh, to, to practice redistribution in the barrio? We cannot really do redistribution if we leave out the tomatoes. And then in this great passage, after Jesus tells his disciples what his food, what his purpose was, look at what he says. He says, you have a saying. Four more months and then the harvest. But I tell you, take a good look at the fields. The crops are now ripe and ready to be harvested. And my friends, what I want to close with tonight is I want to tell you that all over this country, our Latino communities, our barrios are ripe and they're ready for the harvest. And God wants to be, it wants to raise up people to take up the challenge of going to the barrio and making great salsa. In Philadelphia, he wants to challenge you to go to North Philly and to make great salsa in the barrio. In Los Angeles, he wants to challenge you to continue to go into those communities of East L.A. and Whittier and Compton and Pico Rivera and to go with the commitment of making great salsa in the barrio. In Chicago and Humboldt Park, he wants you to take 
this message and he wants you to go and he wants you to make great salsa in the barrio, in Washington and Oregon where the Latinos are hidden away and, they're, and you got to go out and find them. He wants you to go and he wants you to make great salsa in the barrio. He wants you to go in Arizona and Phoenix and Tempe and in, in all those different southwestern cities and he wants you to make great salsa in the barrio. In Dallas, in West Laco, you know where that is? Southern Texas? No amen? Not even one? He's calling the people to go and to make great salsa in the barrio. In the Dominican Republic, God is calling brothers and sisters like Roberto to go out and to make great salsa in the barrio. You, my friends, we have a great opportunity to make great salsa for the glory of God, to make great salsa for the glory of His kingdom. But wherever you are and wherever you're doing ministry, let me ask you not to do one thing. I want to ask you not to leave out the tomatoes. My will, says Jesus, is to do the will of He who sent me and to accomplish the work that He called me to do. May God grant us the grace to take up the challenge to go out and make great salsa in the body. Amen. Amen. Let us stand together.